fireside chat with Professor Hugo Risley. Dr. Risley is one of the distinguished neurological surgeons in American neurosurgery. I think it's a proper occasion that we're carrying this on at the annual meeting of the American Association of Neurological Surgeons. Dr. Risley is a past, past uh, moderator, speaker, vice president. He's done about everything in neurosurgery, and that's one of the reasons that we're so indebted to him to spend some time with us today about his career in neurosurgery. Dr. Risley was born August the 20th of 1916 in Newark, New Jersey. His father was a tailor who had come from Italy. Dr. Risley, what do you think was the first time that you considered becoming a physician? Well, my father seemed to th and mother seemed to think uh, that this is what I should do, and I had several relatives uh, in Italy and in America who were physicians, and uh, it's amazing how I, uh, uh, I accepted this and uh, uh, believed this is what I should do. And at about that time, uh, when I was about five years old, my brother was already a second year medical student at the University of Naples. He went there when he went to Italy to live with my grandparents when he was nine because my father thought that he, he would move back to Italy someday. and. Uh, and in those days, uh, uh, at least my father thought that the, the medicine, uh, the, the quality of teaching of medicine was much better in Europe than in the United States uh, uh, because at that time we weren't so far away from the barber colleges of the early 1900s. Uh, and surprisingly, I never thought about doing anything else. Uh, um, so in the early days, you were thinking of being a physician and then that towards a general surgeon. And you entered Johns Hopkins University in 1937 and then graduated, matriculated into the medical school where you graduated in 1943. What about your interest well, really, in surgery? I, I graduated from Hopkins Medical School in 19... Uh, 40 and I uh, graduated from the Johns Hopkins University uh, undergraduate school in 1936 having uh, uh, spent some time in the graduate school of chemistry. So you did a graduate degree in chemistry before you entered the medical school? Well, uh, I had uh, somehow uh, completed all the courses I needed for an AB degree at the end of my second year, and uh, uh, I, I was able to get a, a, a fellowship in the Graduate School of Chemistry. Uh, and since I had to stay there for three years in order to satisfy the uh, requirements for an AB degree, uh, I went into the Graduate School of Chemistry for one year. Well, you finished high school at a very young age then. Uh, yes, I was uh, about 15 when uh -huh. I finished high school. And so you, you graduated from the medical school with an MD. Of course, they required an internship to give you the MD, didn't they, in those years? Uh, no, not at Hopkins. Uh, they required you to take the Maryland State Board exam, but uh, you did not have to intern to get your degree. Mm -hmm. But did you think about neurological surgery when you were in medical school? Not really. I. Uh, I thought about general surgery. Uh, it was purely an accident that uh, uh, took me to neurological surgery. Uh, I was um, the Harvey Cushing Fellow in, in the laboratory at the Hunterian. And, um, as a general surgery resident. As a general surgery resident, as part of this. And Blaylock had just come to Hopkins as professor of surgery, and he was concerned about uh, the long uh, general surgery residency at the time, which was eight to ten years. And the neurosurgical residency at Hopkins uh, was only, was a rotation for the general surgical residents. And people like uh, Barnes Woodall uh, 
who finished the general surgery residency at Hopkins, spent two years on the brain team. And so did Daryl Hart, who became the professor of surgery at Duke. Uh, when Blaylock came, in his attempt to shorten the residency, he convinced Dandy that um, the two men on the brain team at the time, who were Charles Trollin and Franco Tenisak, should stay in neurosurgery and should not go on with uh, general surgery. And then uh, Blaylock uh, insisted that I go into neurosurgery and that I uh, uh, become uh, a Franco Tenisak assistant resident when Charlie Crowland finished. And, that was uh, about 1942? That was about 1942, 43, yeah, 42. And um, uh, that, that really was the, the first time uh, people were on the brain team who would then stay in neurosurgery. I, uh, I didn't know that uh, Blaylock uh, uh, and was gonna uh, that he he would have uh, allowed me to go on general surgery if I refused to do this. I only learned this later, <laughs> so I went down to try to enlist in the Na Navy to go into the medical corps of the Navy, but they wouldn't take me because I wore glasses. So I gave up and uh, agreed to work for Doctor uh, on the brain team. I'd, I'd had previous experience on the brain team during both as a student substituting as an intern in surgery and uh, when I first started in surgery I'd spent some time on the brain team and I uh, disliked neurosurgery I disliked Dr. Dandy <laughs> 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 uh, and so you didn't really have any intention of making a career of neurosurgery you well, were just serving where you had been assigned by Dr. Blaylock well um, when he assigned me to neurosurgery and I finally agreed to go I realized that if I were going to do it, I probably would uh, stay in neurosurgery, and I realized that this probably was a great opportunity, that, that neurosurgery was certainly uh, here to stay, and that uh, uh, general surgery was really not an ideal specialty because of specialization, and I, I felt that you could become an expert in a short time in a small field like neurosurgery, and that was not likely to happen in general surgery mm -hmm. for many years. So after thinking it over, I thought maybe I, I could get used to Dr. Dandy, and if I could survive it, maybe it was a good idea. So you spent two years on the service with Dr. Dandy. That's correct. And wh what about the things? You started not liking him. Did you still feel that way when you finished? Well, no, I had great respect for him when I finished. Uh, it wasn't that I didn't like him. I was afraid of him, and I... Uh, I didn't understand uh, this method of teaching. Uh, uh, what do you mean? Well, when you worked uh, on the brain team, uh, you never spoke to Dr. Dandy unless you were the resident. Uh, you never asked any questions, uh, and uh, you, you, uh, all the information was handed down from resident to resident, for example. If a patient came in at 2 o'clock in the morning, and as they often did with discs from Johnson City, he had many patients referred from Endicott Johnson in New York, their train came in about 2 o'clock in the morning. They arrived at the Johns Hopkins Hospital at 3 a.m., and you worked up a disc as if this patient was a brain tumor who might not be conscious the next morning, and you, to the extent that you even got the x-rays. And if the next day one of the uh, air injections proved to be negative uh, and the patient did not require a craniotomy, there would be time to slip this patient in for disc surgery. So every patient was worked up from the, almost the minute they came to the hospital. Everything was an emergency. Everything was an emergency. And um, when I was resident, for example, if I knew that there was a depressed fracture in the emergency room, uh, I wouldn't tell anybody about it uh, until I'd made my call for the evening to Dr. Dandy and gotten that out of the way, and then I would declare an emergency. And uh, I would expect that the intern would have the instrument set up in 15 minutes and that the uh, case would get going uh, in 20 minutes from the time I 
posted it uh, because some night one of our post-operative cases was going to need to be evacuated immediately or an epidural hematoma would come to the emergency room that, that would need immediate uh, attention. And the idea was to keep the team tuned to being on the ball 24 hours a day. And, uh, and a word that you said there about the intern preparing the instruments, this was the same heritage of Dr. Cushing that the first level house officer had to sterilize instruments and pack them and get them ready for the operation? Yeah, he picked them the night before and uh, uh, Dandy had an uncanny way of knowing if some instrument he hadn't used for six months wasn't in the pack, he would ask for that instrument. And uh, the, the intern was taught to recognize the, the favorite joker by the jiggle of the handle. He was taught to uh, uh, recognize the favorite bayonet forceps by uh, uh, the worn handle. And uh, he, he, was, uh, he had to test each hemostat he put into the set. So the intern was on the service for? About six weeks. Six weeks, and he had to learn that in that period of time, then a new one went through the same process. That's correct. And many of them would never come back to the brain team for no. the rest of their career. They hated it <laughs> because it, it was uh, difficult for them and they were scared to death. And uh, uh, it, it's, I think over the years, several of them fainted. When, says Dr. Dandy, who always worked in the dark with his headlight, shown his headlight on an intern to give him hell over something. Uh, but, um, and then there were occasional people, uh, for example, George Hayes, who loved it so much that he, he'd substitute for, for an intern any time. He must have taken two or three uh, rotations on the brain team. This is about the same vintage and years as Dr. Nafziger, of course, in San Francisco, and there was always a story of an intern there who I think had about the same sort of duties, and he went to his room in the hospital, locked himself, barricaded the door, and stayed there for four days, not coming out to all the entreaties of the residents and the uh, dean and so forth, and finally they got a psychiatrist and got him out. Do you, do you remember anything like that with Dr. Dandy? Well, not, nothing quite that bad, but, uh, but I, I remember stories of interns fainting as he turned to them and asked for something or shown his headlight on them. You remember anything about his uh, sort of running battle with Dr. Cushing? There's always these stories of the Dandy Cushing feud that went on from. Well, Dandy um, uh, must have respected Cushing, but uh, and he he did say to uh, in a letter to Fulton that he owed a great deal to to Cushing, um, but. Dandy um, uh, also was hurt by Cushing. Uh, you know, there, uh, when Cushing left Hopkins in 1912, um, Dr. Dandy, I think, expected to go to the Brigham with, uh, with Cushing. As a matter of fact, Halstead, who was in Europe when Cushing left, also thought that Dandy was going to the Brigham with Cushing. Uh, and then when he left for his summer vacation uh, for Europe that summer, he, he expected Dandy would, would have gone with Cushing. And uh, when Cushing did not take Dandy, Dandy was out of a job. And the uh, director of the hospital, Dr. Smith, uh, gave Dandy a room in the hospital uh, waiting uh, Halstead's return, uh, hoping that Halstead would find a place on the surgical house staff. Now, Cushing, when he left for the Brigham, uh, went through some of uh, Dandy's research because Dandy was, had been working for uh, Cushing uh, at the Surgical Ontarian his first year out of medical school. That was from 1910 to 1911. And the Dandy's second year after medical school, uh, Dandy served as uh, as uh, Halstead's assistant in the hospital, and, and doing neurosurgery primarily. And uh, 
they apparently didn't get along too well. But when Cushing tried to pack Dandy's uh, work from the Hunterian in his uh, luggage to take to Boston, Dandy told him that he couldn't do that, that this was Dandy's work, and, uh, and Cushing threw the the uh, material back uh, at Dandy, saying uh, that probably isn't worth taking anyhow. Uh, and then there was a, a second problem. Cushing's uh, book on acoustic tumors came out in 1917, and of course it was an important monograph. Uh, shortly after it came out, Dandy published a, a brief uh, report in the bulletin of the Johns Hopkins Hospital uh, on total extirpation of eighth nerve tumors, which Cushing had said was impossible in his monograph. And Cushing first wrote a letter to the editor of uh, the bulletin of the Johns Hopkins Hospital, but had second thoughts and sent it to Dandy instead, saying that uh, or Cushing implied that Dandy had done something very bad. He, he had written this uh, brief report, but he had not mentioned any, he had given, hadn't given any references and hadn't mentioned any of Cushing's work, and that, uh, you know, uh, Cushing was concerned that after all, Dandy had some training with Cushing, and, and this did not look right. and. Uh, uh, Dandy then, in turn, mailed this uh, letter uh, to the uh, editor of the Johns Hopkins Bulletin. Uh, uh, Dr. Smith was the editor and was also the director of the hospital. Mm -hmm. And uh, Dandy said that he, he didn't know what to ascribe this uh, attack from Cushing, excepting possibly the personal animus. Uh, well, as and then later, when Dandy, in 1918, when he published uh, his work on ventriculography, uh, Cushing criticized him a good bit, but uh, it said that Cushing did do ventriculograms behind closed doors. And in national meetings, uh, Cushing uh, kind of criticized the air injections, but um, you know, they led to allowing Dandy to go after third ventricle tumors, lateral ventricle tumors, deep tumors that uh, were, were undiagnosed by other means. So here, Dandy, still a resident in general surgery under Halstead, is, uh, is publishing, uh, well, he'd already mm -hmm. published uh, some wonderful work on hydrocephalus, uh, which uh, Halstead said uh, would be his best work and that he'd never be able to publish anything as, uh, that was as important or as good as that because nobody in medicine uh, publish, uh, you know, could discovers uh, or writes any, any more than one great paper. And, uh, but that wasn't true. Then they, they, he, he had a lot of innovative things, didn't he? When did he actually become a professor or, or really considered part of the attending staff in neurosurgery? Um, well, he worked with Hoyer, who then left for, uh, for Cincinnati, and uh, he uh, finished his residency in about uh, 1919, uh, and then published, and during that year he published that page, paper on uh, 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 pneumoencephalography. Uh, then when Hoyer left, Dandy was doing all of the neurosurgery at Hopkins. Mm -hmm. And you trained really with Dandy closely from 1942 to 1944 when you then went into the U.S. Mm -hmm. Army right. as a neurosurgeon. That's correct. And uh, worked there then for almost two years and mm -hmm. had contact with uh, Dr. Barnes Woodall and yes. was at the Walter Reed as yes. chief yeah. of neurosurgery finally before you. Yes, uh, remember Barnes finished. Woodall was the chief of neurosurgery for the zone of interior of the interior, and Sperling was uh, who had started. Uh, well, I mean, early in the war, had, was assigned to Walter Reed, and then he he brought 
Woodall in, who became chief for the zone of the interior, and Sperling was the chief of neurosurgery for the European theater. Mm -hmm. And then um, uh, Sperling, I mean, Woodall was to go to the Pacific Theater, and Sperling was to come back to Washington, but of course the war ended, fortunately. Yes, the European theater was over in 44, and then Japan in April, so yeah. 45, wasn't it? Or 40, yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so then when you finished at Walter Reed, uh, you went to Washington, D.C., and became... Yeah, the European theater was open in 40, uh, over in, wasn't it 45? Yeah, 45, 45. Um, Sometime there between 44 and 45, yeah, everything 45. came to a halt. Yeah. And I guess it was about August of 45 when the atomic bomb was right. dropped. And in so then the Japan Pacific Japan Theater was over, over then. Mm -hmm. I guess that's right. April 45 in Europe and uh, right. August and September 45 Correct. in Japan. Uh, so you started practice in Washington, D.C. in January of 1947 and yeah. immediately had an appointment at George Washington University yeah. as a an professor of surgery of, or well, did you really become a neurosurgical? Well, Brian Blades um, first appointed me in general surgery and Waller Freeman and Watts were at GW. And Waller Freeman, as you remember, was a psychiatrist, neurologist. As a matter of fact, strangely enough, at George Washington, the departments of uh, neurosurgery and uh, neurology were one department and uh, Freeman called me up one day and says you're not gonna take out kidneys and resect stomachs and I said no he says wouldn't you rather uh, be in neurosurgery and I said fine I'll join the department of neurosurgery and that uh, well, was the department. So then that's when your own career began in neurosurgery? In, in and 47 yes. What was neurosurgical practice like? Well at that time um, at GW, uh, Watson Freeman were doing a, a great number of lobotomies. Um, and most people in Washington hadn't uh, done uh, any significant number of discs, but, uh, but those of us who'd been in the Army and uh, having worked with Dr. Dandy, of course I had done many discs, but strangely enough, I didn't see a disc in private practice, uh, or one was not referred to me for about a year. I mean, the first two weeks that I was in practice, I did uh, ten, 10 craniotomies in the first two weeks. Uh, some of them were at the VA hospital, some were at Walter Reed, and uh, many of them were at emergency hospital, which was about two blocks away from the, the White House. and. Uh, rather close uh, to GW uh, and I was doing most of my work at, at emergency hospitals since uh, a emergency hospital had an excellent staff and they they did have a well-trained neurosurgeon there who died just before I'd come to town Dr. Shigru who was trained at the Mayo Clinic and um, I did most of my work at emergency hospital but would do an occasional case uh, at George Washington. I, I might do four or five cases in emergency for every uh, one or two at George Washington, but they were only uh, three or four blocks apart. So it was and, and these were trauma cases plus intracranial uh, uh, problems that had reached the point where they became unconscious. Or yes, were near emergencies. Yeah, the emergency hospital was a kind of a trauma center. I mean, it had an ambulance and it. Uh, it received all the um, uh, trauma from the western side of uh, Washington. Being in Washington, you had contact with the political scene, and I'm sure that you took care of senators and representatives, and you had contact with with the White House and with President Eisenhower and things. Uh, you remember anything about that that was particularly significant in your, your recollections? Well, I remember examining Eisenhower one day, but this was at uh, Walter Reed when the uh, uh, aide to the general called me up and he said, uh, I want you to meet uh, on such and such a ward tomorrow at 8 o'clock. Uh, 
to examine the chief of staff, I didn't really know who the, I wasn't sure who the chief of staff was, and my answer was, I've got to do a pituitary tumor tomorrow at 8 o'clock, and I'm going to the operating room. <laughs> <laughs> and he told me in, in uh, no uncertain terms that I was going to be examining the chief of staff, and uh, I somehow asked him who the chief of staff was, and he says he's a five-star general, and I, then I got the picture. I, I wasn't sure whether he was talking about Marshall or Eisenhower, but it finally sunk in, and we met, I remember, in the infectious disease section at uh, Walter Reed in this barren room with an old ex bedside table against this ugly bed that had been painted about a hundred times and it had many thick coats of paint on it and the only thing in the room was Eisenhower and Time magazine on the nightstand and the, it, it happened to be an issue and which had Eisenhower's picture on the cover and he had been admitted under an assumed name and uh, he had neck pain and shoulder pain on the left side, as I remembered, and his deltoid was atrophy and weak, and he had rheumatoid spondylitis. And, uh, well, the chief of medicine, the chief of orthopedics, and I were there, and, of course, I even knew enough to know that you didn't retire five-star generals. <laughs> when we went back to see the commanding general of the hospital, the chief of orthopedics says, <laughs> He's got rheumatoid arthritis, uh, rheumatoid spondylitis. I think we ought to retire him. Uh, with this, the uh, commanding general uh, <laughs> had to pick himself off the floor and said, "I hope you didn't tell him that." <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I, I remember doing a head and neck compression on him from the rear, and he winced, and I said, "Does that hurt?" So he uh, he said no and winked at the three doctors standing in front of him. Uh, I guess he thought I was pretty stupid to ask the question since it was obvious that I had heard him. Uh, but that was uh, interesting. I uh, had another interesting experience in the White House. Uh, um, Truman's physician, who uh, was an ENT uh, physician, but uh, uh, when the war was over in Europe and he came back to Washington, uh, spent some time at Walla Reed being recycled. And uh, I remember uh, the chief of surgery, Mike Bowers, would uh, put a stitch in the peritoneum and have uh, this man hold a suture throughout the operation to retract the peritoneum. And he spent a month on my service and I helped him do uh, few peripheral nerve injuries, uh, sutures. And he invited me to the White House uh, one Saturday when uh, Truman was away at the Army-Navy game. And another Army, regular Army Medical Corps officer accompanied me to the White House. And I remember sitting at Truman's desk with my uh, feet comfortably uh, positioned on the top of the desk and hoping that my friend would take a picture, uh, and he did. But uh, as we were leaving the White House, he, he was informed he couldn't have a camera in the White House. As a matter of fact, the visitors were not allowed in the White House except by special invitation. And I think my friend, who was in the Reagan Army, decided <laughs> to be better off not to develop the picture. So I never. <laughs> the next time I went to the White House was uh, after operating on Kennedy's uh, secretary, Mrs. Lincoln, who uh, was in emergency hospital uh, having a um, re stomach resection when, on about the third day, she had a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Mm. She developed, when I examined her that Sunday night, she had some weakness of both legs. And, you know, I assumed that maybe she had a rupture of an anterior communicating aneurysm. And after two arteriograms, uh, I got the picture. And I did a myelogram, and she had a neurofibroma about T9. And we took that out and 
Kennedy subsequently invited me to the White House, and uh, uh, he he was uh, an amazing person. Uh, as a matter of fact, he had me visit with the um, White House doctor who told me that when Kennedy came down to see him, he could carry on a telephone call, look, uh, read a magazine, and discuss whatever he came down to see this physician about. And, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, his ability to read, uh, you know, something like 2,500 words a, a minute was well known in the White House. And all the offices in the White House had uh, current journals available to him so that if he came in to talk to you, he, he could look at, a, <laughs> at one of these magazines. That must be sort of disconcerting for the guest to be trying to talk with the president and he's there thumbing through the yeah. current journal. Well, but you know, these are with people that he worked with every day and he goes to somebody's office and he's waiting <laughs> to talk on the telephone. But, but this, he was well known for this, and I, of course he was a very articulate person. What about at the university? How many residents trained with you? Now it's been 30 years. Well, 30 years. Um, no, it's been 40 years that you've been actually training residents. Didn't you start right in 47 with yes, the residency I, program? Yes, I started in 47 and had something to do with the residency program. I ran it uh, since 1969, uh, but uh, but in the first um, 20 years or so, I, I did have a lot, you know, I did mm -hmm. teach in the residency program. And uh, I guess in those days, we finished about one resident uh, every year. Subsequent to 69, we, we finished two a year. Um, we... Um, so you've I'd, been involved in the training about 50 residents? Yes, at least. Mm -hmm. And, um, well, one of our residents, uh, Kuss, is now the professor in Austria. Mm -hmm. I think we trained um, probably the one of the best residents in Turkey, uh, one of the best neurosurgeons in Turkey, was, uh, was one of our residents. I had a resident who uh, went back to Iran and uh, remained there until a year or two ago. Uh, uh, he had an interesting uh, period there. He apparently uh, knew Khomeini fairly well. And he'd been a, uh, uh, a physician to the uh, to the Shah when he was uh, out of shortly after uh, graduating from medical school. Uh, but uh, during the period when our hostages were in trouble over there, he called me up and talked for an hour or two and criticized the government. And he never seemed concerned about uh, anybody listening in. Uh, uh, in recent years, um, uh, they offered him a position as um, Minister of Health, and he'd say, no, I'm not interested in that, and they order him to the Iraqi front for a couple of months to do uh, uh, neurosurgery at the front. Next time, they offered him the job as dean of the medical school, and he said he didn't want that, so they sent him back to the front for two more months. <laughs> <laughs> That's sort of making him an offer he can't refuse. He's right. <laughs> he since... Uh, come to the United States and uh, it was his first opportunity uh, after finishing to come back and he's taken his boards and is now practicing in Virginia. Uh -huh. You've always had sort of a national reputation for your publications on post-operative complications and we used to sort of kid you about uh, that uh, the reason you were an expert must have meant that you had a lot of them. But I don't think that's really true. How no. did you get started on that particular well, subject? Well, Norman and I decided in the early 60s that the, the, the complications in neurosurgery were just not in the literature. People would... Yeah, they didn't talk about them. Didn't talk about them. And, and we felt that it was important to bring these out. Of course, uh, Norman Horowitz attributes our complications to our residents. As a matter of fact, he 
he can uh, think of a complication and name the resident on the case. But uh, really, I don't know that we have had any more complications than anybody else. We just collect them. <laughs> <laughs> What's the most memorable incident or event that's happened to you in neurosurgery? Well, let's... Uh, Well, there are many, you know, uh, having a, uh, a, a successful operation uh, and, a, and an excellent result. Uh, when you see somebody who's been diagnosed as having MS, comes in uh, virtually quadriplegic, uh, of course not completely, and is wheelchair ridden and bed ridden and uh, uh, supposedly the patients had a, a myelogram, cervical myelogram, and said it's negative, and you do another one and find a nice foramen magnum meningioma, and you think that's great, but you think maybe it's too late to get that patient walking, and then you luck out, take the tumor out, and find that within a month or so, the patient is beginning to walk about for the first time in a year or so. Uh, mm -hmm. I mean, that sort of thing. and. Uh, being sent a patient that supposedly has a intramedullary uh, spinal cord tumor that somebody else has explored and unfortunately they've missed uh, an extramedullary meningioma and now they're uh, virtually bedridden and uh, uh, you've, you uh, have hopes of improving the patient but you think that they're not going to come back and then seeing the patient walk uh, I can. I, I think that sort of business uh, has given me the most thrill. I think that's right of the mark of the true clinician and the, you know, the art of practice of neurosurgery, which you have been such a perfect uh, example of and role model for all your residents and so many of us in practice in neurosurgery that have had the uh, great fortune of knowing you, Hugo. Well, thank you very much, Cohn. I, uh, I must say that. Uh, I think you've contributed a lot more. Oh, thank you. On the personal side, you've got four children. All sons are there, and one of them's a physician? No, one of them, uh, one, yeah, I have four children, uh, three boys and one girl. Oh, you do have a girl. Yes, she's a <laughs> twin of the physician. He's a neurologist in mm -hmm. the Boston area. He boarded in medicine and neurology. Uh, I have one son who's an expert at building race cars, but it, he loses a lot of money every time he builds another race car. So we've got to get him into some other kind of work, especially since... Uh, uh, Are I, you having to underwrite that every time yeah, he builds that well, race car? I own the company. <laughs> well, I know. My wife owns the company, so <laughs> I've got to pay the debts of the company. But uh, he's... Uh, gotten a lot of publicity in the racing magazines and uh, he seems to get a kick out of it but uh, we can't stand it financially. Well you're now 72 years of age. Well really I'm uh, in August. 71 in August. 71? 16 and 87. 87 okay and you're getting ready to relinquish the professor chairmanship that's what are you correct. going to do now? Are you looking for a new career? Are you uh, going to keep practicing neurosurgery? Well, no, I'm not going to keep practicing neurosurgery for several reasons, but um, uh, I'm going to smell the roses for, for a while and then uh, do a lot of the reading that I should have done or wanted to do in the past and, and uh, get involved in computerizing uh, or uh, playing with computers and maybe uh, getting my books organized for the first time. But not practicing clinical neurosurgery? No, I don't think, uh, you know, I think the malpractice situation is such that it's kind of ridiculous. It makes so, it hard to slow down or to do part-time practice because that's, that's the cost cool. of taking care of one operation a year is just as much if you had a busy practice. That's correct. That's a shame. And uh, especially with the claims made business. Mm -hmm. And then after, even if I did consultation work alone, uh, God only knows what the tail end even of a, uh, you know, that, that level one uh, malpractice insurance and a claims made policy. Might be in might the future. Be, might be in the future, mm -hmm. yeah.
Well, whatever you do, Hugo, I know that you're going to be active and contributing to everyone around you. Well, I, I, I certainly would like to stay active, and I certainly would like to continue coming to the meetings and uh, uh, enjoy what everybody else is doing. Well, thanks very much. That's Dr. Risley, the you. professor of neurosurgery at George Washington University.